Hello, everybody. Welcome to Noisy Thinking, our first of the autumn. I'm Sarah Newman. I'm the director of the APG, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you this evening. Before we start the main part of the evening, I just want to say a special thank you to Google, who are our long-term partners and collaborators on the APG Strategy Awards and also on YouTube Works for Brands, which have created a great um, repository of really useful thinking. Um, also, to recommend to you uh, that you go and look at Think with Google, which is an excellent resource for planners and strategists of every kind. Also, to say thank you to Flamingo, but they're going to have plenty of airtime this evening, so I'll leave that for a moment. Before we start the main part of the evening, I just want to mention a couple of things that are coming up in the APG calendar, which you may have heard of and may not yet have got a ticket for. The first is our strategy conference, which is on the 8th of October. It's about contrarian thinking. We have Mark Ritson headlining and a number of amazing speakers who come from within and without the universe of advertising, marketing, planning, strategy, and research. And also a new book, one of two books we're publishing this year. You may well have seen or bought a copy of How Not to Plan, which is a modern handbook for planning. We're into a second print run of that. It's proved really popular. We've got a new book coming out called Eat Your Greens, which is a compendium of marketing and communications thinking by some of the very best practitioners and thinkers in our community from around the world. I think there are about 37 contributions and they are all on subjects which are of very special interest to those people. And they're all based on fact and evidence. So we'll be launching that on the 11th of October, same week as the conference. And tickets are available for both of those on our site. But in particular for the conference, they're running out. So get yours quickly to be there. Um, this evening, Flamingo are going to be treating us to some really amazing research they've done on Generation Z and authority. And I'm going to hand over to Hazel Wilkinson, who's going to... Uh, take over the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Sarah. So good evening, everyone. As Sarah said, my name's Hazel Wilkinson. I'm the head of client leadership at Flamingo. Thanks, first of all, very much for spend, choosing to spend your Wednesday evening with us. Um, Flamingo is really proud to be the sponsor of APG's Noisy Thinking series. These sessions, in our opinion, really do represent the best of the best of creative and provocative thinking. As Sarah said, thank you to Google for hosting and also to Sarah and the APG and the team there for being such great partners. Let's check if this works. There we go. First hurdle overcome. So. Tonight we're here to talk about Generation Z, those born after 1995. By 2019, this age group will account for 32% of the global population, which makes it absolutely vital that we as planners and strategists really understand them. The, way, the work that we're presenting tonight looks at how Generation Z are redefining authority. It looks at the ways that it's changing, how that authority is expressed and experienced. And it's absolutely important that brands need to understand how to persuade people. And in order to do that, you have to have authority. In order to have that authority, you need to understand it. So authority means different things to different generations. It changes over time. It looks different depending on the cultural space that you occupy. And tonight, we're going to explore in detail what it means for Gen Z, what it means for how brands demonstrate authority in an ever-changing cultural landscape. We'll take you through some core principles for understanding what kind of authority you or your clients need to build. It will take you through some brands that are doing well and also some who aren't quite yet nailing it. And we'll give you some strategic recommendations for how you should go about building your authority with this generation. And who better to do that than our awesome team at Flamingo of Susie, our head of futures, <coughs> Michelle from our semiotics practice, Anna, who co-founded Flamingo's Youth Collective. And I should also mention Matt, who's not going to be speaking tonight, but it's another co-founder of the Youth Collective and who's responsible for the short film that you're going to see in a moment. After the work's presented, we're going to have a panel discussion that will be hosted by Tarek, uh, another co-founder of our Youth Collective. And he's going to invite a number of experts and insiders, some of whom have contributed to and been part of this research. And we'll have a panel discussion and then open it, open it up to you guys to give some questions from the floor. <coughs> 
There's a hashtag associated with this evening. You'll see it on the bottom of all of the slides. Hashtag redefining authority. We'd love it if you wanted to tweet your thoughts and opinions as you go along, um, and we can see what your thoughts were about the content we're going to present. So let's jump in. We're going to start by playing a film to find out a bit more about how Gen Z are redefining authority. The people in this country have had enough of experts. Yeah, there's no protection. Mm -hmm. You still got 350 murders that ain't being solved. And then you got the police and like kids washing windows, which both are not mutually exclusive. I can't trust the institutions, which I don't think is the same. I think there's a nuance that's different. Like, it's not about being anti-institutionalist and being like, fuck society mm. and fuck the man. It's more about being like, look, the man isn't there for us, so we need to do it ourselves. Thank you. I applaud them all. I think it's brave and I think it's important to speak out and not by shame by anyone. It is not always easy, but we have to do that. And that's why I posted, and I will say it right now out loud, me too. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think my generation needs the media. Like, we got social media where we tell our stories ourselves. That man was Ernesto de la Cruz, the greatest musician of all time. We've never known anything about this man. But whoever he was, he still abandoned his family. Beyonce's amazing, but, like, her, her brand is literally being a queen. Like, and there's only so much you can, like, see yourself in that. You can look up to that and look up to traditional celebrities, but you can't see yourself in them. That's why you get more a plethora of discussions um, in Generation Z than you do before, because it's not like we all look up to the same people. We all have different influences, and we feel like we get to choose our influences. And when we're not happy with our influences, we're happy to, like, leave them. Thank you for that amazing film, Matt. Um, so yeah, you'll see at the end of that, we said, what are those new ground rules? So we set about to find out. Um, as Hazel said, I'm Susie. I'm the head of futures at Flamingo. Um, doesn't mean I have a crystal ball. Uh, it just means I look very closely at change happening today to figure out what's the best thing to do for tomorrow. So we were looking at today really closely. Uh, and what were we doing? We were looking at Gen Z redefining authority. Okay, so I thought first of all you might have some questions. Uh, why Gen Z? Why now? Why authority? And to be fair, you'll be forgiven if perhaps you're having a slight internal eye roll uh, at the sign of more agencies promising to unlock the, the secrets of a mysterious Gen Z. Uh, you know, we can tell you what they are, what they do, what they think. Um, the idea is, haven't we moved past that idea of demographics really defining people? Um, and it's true, and at Flamingo, we don't really look uh, at consumers, we've banned that word internally. Um, we want to look at people, and the interesting and brilliant and irritating thing about people is that they have a tendency to kind of slip right out of the boxes that you want to put them in. Um, but the thing about us as cultural strategists is it's our job and our passion and such a privilege to try and make sense of something as fluid and complex and fast-moving as culture. And to do that, sometimes we need a bit of a heuristic. Um, a heuristic, for anyone who doesn't know, and I'm sure you all do, um, is just a mental shortcut. Um, and in the work we do in researching and strategizing culture, we have various heuristics that we use, from mappings to lenses to like samples of people that we think can tell us about more people. Um, and we really use them to try and get to the essence of something real big. Um, and from this, that's where we get the insights that we boil down to, and that's how we help guide and advise our clients and our partners. And the thing about generations is as imperfect as they are, they're still really valuable in giving us that shortcut, um, especially when it's such a big, complex, and exciting topic. Because generations are basically heuristics for change. And what makes Gen Z a particularly good and valuable one for this question? OK, so it's really <coughs> one simple thing. Um, in a way, they're the first generation who you can arguably say are digital natives. 
Um, and we kind of think of their predecessors, their big brothers and sisters, and even now their parents, I think, uh, the millennials is pretty digital, right? Uh, we think they're all like Facebook and Instagram and iPhones and beards. Um, but the thing about millennials is um, that as a whole, they're really digital emigrants. They're people who've moved, they've traveled from the physical world that they were born into, into the digital world that we now live in. Um, and they've really, for a lot of the time, led that charge, following kind of Zuckerberg and Musk and all these people, but they weren't the first. They adapted and they created, and that was great. Um, but why are we interested in Gen Z, so those born after 1995? Well, if you think about it, the oldest were only 12 when the iPhone was launched. Um, they spent their entire lives not only online, but their adolescence and emerging adulthood in the smartphone age. And I think this is what's really interesting to me is like, they're the true inheritors of not only the internet-enabled world that has like really changed all of reality for all of us, but they're the true inheritors of what the World Economic, Economic Forum's Klaus Schwab calls the fourth industrial revolution. And that's the wave of invention that follows the internet. Um, that is, and I quote, characterized by a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds, impacting um, quite a lot, all disciplines, all economies, and all industries, and even challenging ideas about what it means to be human. Um, that's quite a big deal, um, but I'm not here to explore the intricacies of gene editing or the blockchain. Um, I mean, trust me, I've tri tried, I still don't really understand what the blockchain is. Um, so yeah, that all sounds pretty overwhelming, but like, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point I'm trying to make? I just think this gets to the heart of understanding why we think there's value in looking at the people who follow millennials, looking at Gen Z. Because the reason I bring up the fourth industrial revolution is because they've grown up in an age of unprecedented technological capacity. Uh, the ability to solve the problems in the world that we have is more in our gift as a human race than ever. But as I'm sure you'll be reminding of looking at that, um, the video that we introduced with, is that our problems can seem more entrenched, more intractable, and more overwhelming than they ever have done. Um, are things worse than ever? I mean, that's a philosophical debate that I'm not going to have here. But what's undeniable is that Gen Z have been more intimately exposed to the failings of authority than any other generation preceding them. And they've also grown up, at the same time, more empowered by media and technology than ever to critique, to debate, and to question that power, to organize online, to share ideas, to share solutions, to feel politically, emotionally, and practically empowered by the smartphones that they've always had in the palm of their hands. So in summary, this is a generation that we feel is valuable to investigate because they're more exposed to the failures of traditional authority than anyone else has been, and they're more equipped, equipped than anyone else has been with the tools to respond to it, to challenge it, and to make it work for them. This is a generation of concerned pra pragmatists who are seeking new solutions and new ideas. So that's why Gen Z. Uh, so why authority? So, um, I mean, I don't know the job titles of everyone in this room, but largely you might be thinking, oh, you know, what does this mean for me? Um, you know, your planners, your strategists, your brand managers. Um, you might think, you know, I'm not Theresa May. I don't think she's in the room. I'd be surprised if she was. Uh, I'm not the Indian government. I'm not a Korean cultural institution. And no, in the traditional sense of the word, you're not authorities. But the traditional use of the word authority is also falling out of favor. Uh, just a simple illustration of this, I borrowed off Google. Hey, Google, <laughs> our generous host. Um, if mentions of the word authority in books and newspapers, it's going down. Uh, so maybe people are saying or using the word authority less, but that's not because authority is going away. It's because it's shape-shifting um, and it's going by other names. Because when you break down authority into its constituent parts, not only has it not changed, but it's actually something that's increasingly possessed by more and more individuals, organizations, and brands outside of traditional power structures. And it's something that really all brands should want and all people should want, because it's variously described as the capacity to, to demand a response, which is quite important, or the power to influence others, which you know in your jobs is also super important. So to understand how it's changing, we needed to really break down this big, scary idea into some, to, uh, some constituent parts. Um, and we wanted to create a bit of a kind of tool for ourselves to like, make it a little bit more manageable. 
Um, and I want to kind of explain how we did that with a quote from one of our experts that we talked to called Claire Benko. Uh, she said, authority is a type of power that works through the generation of degrees of openness, answerability, and trust between participants in authoritative power relationships. So we, so we kind of worked on this and we, and we started thinking about what, what are your like, if you were going to bake an authority cake, what do you need? Like, what, what can you not make it without? Okay. The first thing where it all starts is knowledge. And again, to Claire Blanco, our, our expert, she said it's all about knowledge. You do something because that entity, that authority, knows better than you. So all authority starts in knowledge. Um, and you're thinking, uh, okay, so what's knowledge? So according to the OED definition, knowledge is facts, information, and skills acquired through experience or education. That covers quite a lot of stuff. Uh, that's being an architect, that's being a really cool blogger, that's being a caring friend, uh, that's being a politician, that's running a sustainable cooperative factory that recycles organic cotton. It's all of these things, and it's something that every brand and every individual in this room possesses. So knowledge is about your core capacity. What makes you able to do what you do? So what's the next ingredient in our authority um, trifle? I was going to say trifle. That's fine. <laughs> the next layer, trust. So if your knowledge is strong um, and if it's right, you can start to build trust. Trust is the context in which power and authority blooms. Uh, it's about the quality of your relationships with people. Why should they believe in the knowledge that you possess? Um, and then finally, and this is the serious part, when you've got those in place, comes power. So uh, what's power? Power is just the ability to make people do what you want them to do, uh, which is not sinister, but also but crucial if you're trying to kind of uh, market something or sell something or plan something. Uh, power is influence, and this is pretty important. And what we found and what will become more clear as we go through our slides is that it only really comes up to the first two. You can't really have it as an authority if you don't have the, the first two. Um, so we realize that all of these are necessary to get to your final output of authority. Um, and this is, I just wanted to introduce this to set up the research and to tell you about the kind of lens we use to not only work out our recommendations for brands and for planners, but to kind of really interrogate the things we were looking at and see how they were expressing authority, how they were making authority happen for Gen Z, how were they doing all these different things. Um, so what do we do? How, do? how do we do our research? So it was quite expansive. Uh, we collaborated with research partners uh, based in Mumbai, Seoul, Shanghai, and Mexico City, uh, who told us about the context of shifting authority in their country, um, and who discovered lots of interesting sources of authority that we could inter interrogate. Uh, we spoke to experts in authority, uh, two experts, as I said, Claire Benko, who uh, gave us more amazing, complex, and enlightening ideas than I'm able to capture in any of these slides, a professor of sociology at Warwick University who's part of the Authority Research Network. There's a group of people specifically set up to try and answer this question right now. That's how important it is to other people. Um, and Christian Schultz, who has conducted workshops around ride, wa world ride, worldwide to understand more about Gen Z and their needs from the workplace and their interactions with authority. And we spoke to in, um, various influencers, people who are really on the front line, kind of culturally, kind of uh, creating new forms of authority. We spoke to Kwame Reyes in New York, who's a social activist. We spoke to Elise Bialson in Oslo, who's the youngest ever editor um, in chief of the youth magazine Resens. Uh, Ife Grillo, who's with us tonight, who's going to be on our panel, uh, who's a London campaigner, poet, and former youth MP. Priyanka Paul, who's an illustrator, poet, and student. Um, we spoke to Maria Sando in Mexico City, who's the founder of an inclusive modeling agency. She took it upon herself to get more inclusive faces in fashion. And Lisa Ram Ran Hu, who's a filmmaker in Shanghai. So we spoke to these people about their experiences creating new authority in their daily lives. So that's a kind of overview and just a, a bit of context about why now, why Gen Z, and why authority. Um, and now I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Michelle, who's going to take you through some of the findings that we have around what's shaping authority. Hello. So what's shaping authority today? So OK, before we could map authority and sort of look into all the different definitions of what it means today, we need to kind of identify all the forces that are shaping authority. So from these sort of expansive global interviews with our lovely influencers and our experts as well, um, and through this integrated semiotics and futures analysis, we identified five distinct needs 
that Gen Z need to get from authority in order for that authority to be meaningful, believable, and powerful to them today. So let's go through one by one and see what they mean. So globally, Gen Z need authority to be enforced by the community. So um, Susie mentioned a bit earlier that young people are often now quite skeptical about traditional authorities' ability to, or, or even their willingness to kind of look out for who they're supposed to be serving. Um, and because of that, Gen Z are starting to kind of assemble their own diverse communities um, and draw support from those communities instead. And what happens within those communities is that all parties are considered accountable to the community's moral code and what happens within that community. So in order to keep that community vibrant, communities need to make sure that everyone is held accountable uh, for upholding those shared values. So Ify Grillo, who is an influencer who's here with us tonight and who you'll see participating in our exciting panel a bit later on, has said, um, is a campaigner and poet and former youth M MP based in the UK. And you, if, if, if he has have said that institutions aren't accountable like our generation is. Uh, we call each other out on being problematic. So it's really about um, keeping everyone accountable for what happens within a community or a group rather than just one figurehead or one singular authority figure. Let's look at the next one. So Gen Z also need authority to uh, come from those who are open uh, and who are able to show their vulnerability. So what does that mean? So I think young people today, we've found, are living in this kind of post-perfect social world. Um, so what I mean by that is it's Gen Z, it's kind of, it forms an anxious generation who feel quite reassured when they see their anxieties and their insecurities sometimes mirrored by the people that they're admiring. So it's really about kind of, you know, seeing others triumphing over those insecurities really gives you courage to face your own. Um, so an activist in Baltimore who we've interviewed called Kwame Rose says, you see people go crazy like Kanye and it's normal. As humans become more familiar with social media, we become more familiar with ourselves and it's giving us more access to these myth of, mythical figures that we've never had before. So the, the key thing here is that emotional honesty is the new currency for young people. Why? Because speaking openly about your flaws and struggles can now increase your relevance rather than taking away from it. And the key reason for that is because when you show this kind of fearlessness in the face of potential judgment from others, it's about really kind of demonstrating that you've got that full 100% honesty um, to be open with those around you, and in doing so, encourage everyone else to do the same. Okay, so moving on to the third need of what Gen Z would like to see from authority. Um, so Gen Z would like authority to be grounded in lived experience. So why is that significant? It's because traditionally, knowledge has always been, as we all know, in, affirmed by these kinds of big institutions that are quite familiar, whether that be kind of universities or big brands or corporations or companies that we admire. And sometimes these big organizations are quite opaque. But for Gen Z, knowledge that's based in the real world is a lot more practical, is a lot more relevant and useful for them. Uh, so Kwame Rose again, going back to one of his quotes, he uses university in the US as an example of this. So he says, lived experience always outweighs the knowledge you can obtain from a professor. People are like, what the hell do I do with a college degree? College doesn't teach you to apply the knowledge you've obtained or think outside the box. A lot of times it makes you conform. And I think it's not really about nullifying the authority of colleges and universities around the world, but rather about realizing that um, sometimes these institutions have ignored or silenced certain voices at the periphery. And in order to include those voices more into the conversation and to have a, vo a more vibrant conversation, Gen Z are interested in and, and drawn to these sort of people and institutions that can speak honestly to them from firsthand experience. So it's really about being open about where your knowledge comes from, where your knowledge is derived from, rather than kind of imposing knowledge without that sense of openness and honesty. Now, what blooms out of this is our fourth uh, need for Gen Z, which is that authority needs to be shared between us and them. So 
what does that mean? This us, so the, the young generation, which is the us in this case, doesn't necessarily feel understood by the institutions that are supposed to understand them. And the institution is kind of the them in this scenario. So as Susie was mentioning before, and as we saw in the film, um, you know, sometimes the institutions that are supposed to speak for you aren't necessarily seen as doing their job. So what is the reaction? The young people, the, the, the young people, <laughs> Generation Z, <laughs> uh, expect authority to be shared rather than, um, rather than kind of imposed on them. And so at, in, at the same time, the development uh, of technology has provided them the perfect opportunity to take matters into their own hands. So Gen Z can expect to participate in a kind of two-way dialogue with the so-called system in which they exist to make something that's better and more relevant for them going into the future. If yeah, I'm coming back to you again. So you said, it's not about fuck the system. We just need the system to prove why we should trust it. And finally, <laughs> I think that that quote speaks for itself. Um, finally, we have the need that Gen Z need authority to have personal utility. And this is quite an important one leading into um, our mapping of what authority means today. So Gen Z today in Mexico are referred to as generation prepared. And I think that's something that we've found resonates globally as well. As because the world is turning kind of increasingly competitive and because of social media and other factors as well, people are increasingly uh, aware of who they're competing against as well beyond national borders, beyond community borders. So it can be quite overwhelming and young people can get a little bit obsessed with the sense of self-improvement, whether it be uh, at their job, at work, or in their educational institutions. So any kind of environment where you're learning and developing. And so young people have come to respect the sense of authority that's purposeful and that's pragmatic for them and that gives them the tools to act on their beliefs in this fast changing, fast moving world. So we've spoken to uh, Elise By Olson, who, as you recall from Susie's intro, is the youngest ever editor-in-chief of a youth publication, Resense, based in Norway. <laughs> and we see a lot, she says, we see a lot of young designers being open to partnering up with established people, and they're happy to take the money that's from the system. It's a very positive thing. So it's not, uh, it's not really about sort of negating or going against the system, but really seeing where you fit in um, and how you can gain the useful tools that's going to allow you to, to contribute to the system and create your own as well, potentially, in the future. So now that we've talked about the, the ways in which the, so the five sort of Gen Z needs that are shaping new authority, I'm going to turn it over to Anna, who's going to tell us more about what new authority is actually today and what it can mean for your brand. Right, so in order to help us navigate the landscape of new authority and understand where your brand might sit within that, we combined a semiotic mapping of all of the different expressions of authority in culture with our futures research that really explored the needs and drives that are influencing the way that Gen Z um, kind of think about authority, and we produced a map. Um, what we discovered is that new authority really exists along two spectrums. The first is that New authority is drawn from knowledge that it ranges from being stabilizing, so knowledge that feels really reassuring, established, familiar, to knowledge that's more disruptive, so that's rooted in creativity and newness. And along our other axes, um, authority feels either emo it feels like it ranges from being emotional to being more functional and useful. So as a team, we drew up a really exhaustive list of all the brands, um, organizations, institutions, individuals that we feel best embody new authority. And I'm not gonna talk you through all the detail of that today. We're actually producing a white paper in a couple of weeks that will have all of that information in it. But for the sake of this evening, what I wanted to talk to you about was the four key spaces that we identified within new authority, which we think are really useful for a brand to know. So these are, as we've called them, well, Yep. Uh, establishment as platform, disruptive utility, singular visionaries, and timeless connection. So if we just start with establishment as platform, 
This is actually the only space where we feel like old authorities still can feel really, really valuable. The problem with old and kind of traditional expertise and authority is that it can feel quite static and inaccessible when it comes to Gen Z. So the brands that are really embodying this space well are the ones that open themselves up to Gen Z and make, them their, <clears throat> and make their purpose really kind of useful, um, make their knowledge really purposeful and useful. So for example, um, We've already heard that kind of in the educational space, young people are increasingly concerned that the systems that serve them are outdated and insufficient. So in the UK, actually 75% of young people today feel like the university system is outdated and old fashioned. The brands that really embody new authority in this space are the ones that find a way of delivering traditional expertise from a trusted source in a way that really fits with their modern lifestyles. So for example, we have edX up here, which provides courses from really respected institutions like Harvard and MIT, but through an online portal that makes them really flexible and convenient to use when you're looking to supplement your learning. Um, so a real winner for Gen Z. Um, luxury is also a really interesting category that we think sits within this space. Traditionally, luxury has been all about telling people what it is that they want. But for Gen Z, Gucci is a really interesting example of a brand that's embodying new authority. That's not telling Gen Z what they want, but actually giving them what they need and talking to them in a language that really kind of resonates with them. So in this case, Gucci specifically is not talking about the heritage or the craftsmanship of their brand like a lot of other luxury fashion retailers. Instead, what they're doing is they are creating content and collections that really live well on Instagram, which is obviously a space that Gen Z seem to spend a lot of their time. Um, so that's memes to advertise their new watch collection. And it's also really bold colors and big logos. And last year, it was models walking severed heads down the catwalk, stuff that really jumps out. And finally, in this space, um, there's been a real renewed interest from Gen Z in engaging with old wisdom, so kind of traditional um, beauty and wellness practices that really feel like they root them in their own cultural um, heritage or kind of cultural environment. And the brands that are doing really well here are the ones that are finding ways of delivering this old wisdom in a way that's really palatable and accessible for kind of modern lifestyles. So we've got Patanjali and Yu Yang Sang as examples of kind of traditional medis um, Chinese medicine that's delivered in a more kind of um, appropriate uh, format, it's pills versus brewing. So if this space is all about old authority making itself more relevant and more purposeful for a younger generation, disruptive utility is all about creating something new that's really, really useful. So young people today are all users. Most of them have grown up with technology at their fingertips that gives them a real feeling of being in control and like they've got the right to participate, whether that's in politics, activism, art. So the brands that are really embodying um, new authority in this space are the ones that give Gen Z more control. It's the digital platforms and um, social movements that um, really provide them with practical tools that they need to create something for themselves. So to give you some examples to bring this to life, Banking is traditionally an industry that's pretty opaque and relatively inaccessible. That's not just to Gen Z. Um, but there's been a number of fintechs that have come through that are looking to demystify this industry for the next generation of spenders. Monzo, in particular, is a brand that appeals to both millennials and Gen Z. But they're really gaining their authority by sharing power with Gen Z. They're building products with them in a way that makes their users feel like they're empowered, but also ensures that the things that they're making feel really relevant for their actual needs. E-commerce is also a space that sits here. Um, if we think that fashion has typically been about telling people what to wear, we've seen a real flurry of kind of community-based um, shopping platforms emerge, like Little Red Book, which is based in China, that really um, focus instead on providing Gen Z with access to the collective expertise of other Gen Z shoppers, because it's that advice that Gen Z really implicitly trust and look to these days. And then finally in this space, um, social activism um, is seeing a real kind of renaissance, not renaissance, but it's seeing, um, it's really kind of, we're seeing a new breed of organization emerge in this space specifically. So the pink protests and Me Too are examples of organizations that aren't looking to kind of speak on behalf of communities, but instead they're providing a platform to amplify the voices of women in this case, who have actually experienced these things firsthand in order to make sure the message feels more genuine and authentic and therefore kind of resonates more with the audience. So if this top half of our spectrum is more about authority that's derived from practical usefulness, our bottom half is much more about kind of human um, emotion-led narratives. So 
If we start with singular visionaries, um, singular visionaries derive their authority from their ability to pursue an emotional narrative that gives them the authority to establish new norms um, and that uh, kind of pursues narratives that really resonate with Gen Z and the things that they buy into. <coughs> so, for example, I don't think it will be a surprise to anyone in this room that young people today feel pretty alienated and disappointed by um, traditional forms of authority like politics. Um, they often feel like politicians don't actually understand them and they really definitely can't speak for them. Instead, we're seeing a real surge of support for a kind of post-political politician, so the likes of Jeremy Corbyn um, and then Lopez Obrador in Mexico, who don't hide behind political jargon, but instead they, look, they speak with real honesty and passion about the things that they really care about, which really, really sits well with Gen Z and makes them feel um, really bought into the messages that they're projecting. But this kind of radical honesty um, doesn't just generate authority for politicians. It actually works for individuals more broadly in the media landscape. So for example, Rupi Kaur is an example of an Insta poet that speaks with really aggressive vulnerability about her experience being a woman. Um, similarly, BTS is a K-pop sensation that's sweeping across America at the moment. And Sonam Kapoor is um, a highly regarded actress in Bollywood. Both of them are really breaking the norms of their industry by speaking really openly about the, their own flaws and the kind of um, struggles that they've faced in their careers. And it's actually through this that they're establishing new and quite aspirational norms for Gen Z to follow. So obviously, it's quite easy to see where individuals fall in this space, but there is a role for brands to kind of derive authority from a more emotional um, narrative. The only difference is that they have to root their narrative and their message in the product and what they're actually providing and adding to people's lives. So two examples of these are Bloom and Lola. These are both female care brands that sell tampons and pads and PMS oil. And both of them have made it their mission to empower young girls throughout going through puberty. Ultimately, or fundamentally, their authority is derived um, through pursuing this particular message. And that's also through kind of pursuing a female founder narrative um, by girls for girls and by involving a number of influencers in their brand comms. But fundamentally, they always have to bring their message back to their product. And the usefulness of their product is what really bolsters that and makes it really credible, which is why you'll see they sit slightly higher on the spectrum. So finally, um, if this space is about challenging norms through disruptive thinking, what is stabilizing emotional authority for Gen Z? So Timeless Connection is a space that we as a team really kind of um, wrangled with. We went round and round for a while. And what we realized eventually is that this space is really unlike the others. It's a space that feels really quite sacred and it's reserved for the real relationships that make up Gen Z's life, so their family and their friends. In an environment where increasingly we're aware of the potential superficiality of digital relationships, these kind of actual intimate bonds that young people have with particularly their parents um, are increasingly important to them. So that parent-child relationship is one that we explored quite broadly. It seems to be changing across all of the different markets that we looked at. Um, Sparks and Honey reported that 58% of US teens would refer to their parents as um, their best friends, which might come as a surprise to some people. But broadly, I mean, um, Susie sort of mentioned this earlier on, we're all exposed to the same kinds of information. And so what we're finding is that the ideological <laughs> chasm um, between parents and ch children is very much narrowing. And this means that parents are becoming more and more like allies and support systems in people's lives, in their children's lives. So the only example that we put here is Coco, it looks a bit lonely, um, which is a Pixar film that depicts the relationship that a Mexican boy has with his family. And the reason that we put this here is to basically acknowledge that if you're a brand looking to explore this space, it's really important that you're aware of it. But unless you are explicitly exploring the dynamics of this relationship, it's not really an area that we feel that you should enter. <coughs> so that is a bit of a whistle-stop tour of all of the different spaces that we um, covered when looking at new authority. And I'm now going to hand back to Susie, who's going to talk to you about how you can apply these learnings to your brand. Thank you, Thank Anna. You. Thank you. Hello again. Okay. 
so where are we? I'm just going to reorientate. So what did we do? Uh, so we did our research, we talked to experts, and we looked at what was shaping the new landscape of authority, what's, what's driving it, and we used our research partners to tell us about that context globally. Um, and then we used all that research to bring together a source list, which is all of the, the things you see on here, and we boiled that down and boiled that down by saying, which of these really count as an authority? And as you saw before, we wanted to expand that definition to be like, if we really look at which of these count as an authority for Gen Z, what can we find out? And then we map them, and um, it looks simple, but it's actually a really painful and interesting process. Um, and we map them because when you map something, you start to understand the rules that govern that space. Um, and when you understand the rules that govern a space, you can start to find out what the guardrails are, you can start to give advice, and you can start to tell people what the kind of golden rules are of being in this space, what makes this space this space. So that's what we did. Um, we did our contextual research with experts. We did our semiotic analysis with our source list, which was about seven times as long as this, and we had to boil it down. Um, and then we said, OK, so what happens when we pull this apart? What does it tell us that the space we're in? Uh, what does it tell us about the space we're in? And so if you're a brand and you're saying, OK, this is all great, I get it, but like, what, what does this mean for me? What can I learn? What if I want to be an authority to Gen Z? Um, and not in that scary old way where I'm shit it, but in that like, new way, <laughs> where I'm a positive authority, where I mean something, where I resonate, where I'm, I'm trusted and guiding and you believe in me. Um, and from doing all this research um, and from doing all this analysis and from putting our strategic caps on, we really came out with two rules. So what? Should have done that slide first. <laughs> two rules, in a nutshell. Firstly, there's two things you need to do. The first one is really understand the kind of knowledge you possess. So why is this? So this is, this is really the first thing you have to ask, ask yourself. And as I said at the beginning, it's not only brands that possess knowledge that is the seed for all authority, it's every single individual in this room. You have to look inside you and ask you, yourself what, what kind of knowledge you possess. And that's because Gen Z, as we've seen, they're a pragmatic, no bullshit generation. I'm sure they're not the first generation that's been called that, but I think the pragmatism is really important. Um, and they don't want you to pretend to be something that you're not. They want you to authentically and effectively be an authority if you're going to try and do it. Um, and they're going to, if you get it wrong, if you base your authority and knowledge that you don't really have a right to have, they're not only going to call you out on it, but worse than that, they're probably just going to ignore you. So um, this is a really important thing. So what we have detailed, I think you guys have pamphlets that we've given you and that should give you a guide and also in our white paper, is how to really understand on that mapping uh, where your knowledge comes from. What do I have to give? Is it timeless? Am I stabilizing? You know, am I about learned knowledge that comes from generation to generation? Or am I on this side of the map that we, that we spoke about? Am I about disruption? Am I creative? Am I giving you something new? And from talking to our experts, we really found that that side of the map that's about newness and creativity and disruption is where a lot of the energy is. So it's really about understanding your place. You don't have to be where the energy is, but if you're not, then it's about handling it correctly. And the second thing is building power through trust. Um, so for previous generations, whether they were happy about it or not, authority may have been tacitly or explicitly enforced from above. But for post-internet generations, and particularly for our friends, the digital natives Gen Z, um, trust, which you'll remember is a key part of authority, it is the meat in our authority sandwich, um, really needs to be earned. Um, and earning it is about, going back to the map, it's about that axis that goes top to, bo top to bottom, it's about what's your usefulness? What are you doing? What's your purpose? What can you do for me? Because the people who you're asking to give you the privilege of being authority are saying, what can you enable me to do, to feel, to say, to achieve? That means I see you as an authority. That means you can continually prove that, not just to me, but to my group, which is what Michelle was taking us through about authority constantly being enforced by the collective, not just by individuals. Um, and so it's about building trust in that knowledge through your relationships in an authentic and credible way. And we hope that understanding your place on the map will help you do that. And we have exhaustive, detailed recommendations on how to use every position on this map uh, in the white paper um, that we will be sending you. But I wanted to take you through some like core principles and bring it to life with some examples which, yeah, maybe they weren't created by Gen Z, but they're things uh, that are either, for better or worse, doing really well at this kind of new authority that we're seeing resonate with this generation. So what's happening in each space? So 
Well, if you're an establishment as platform. So there's really one golden rule here. So if you're here, it's because you have timeless knowledge. Maybe you're in law, maybe you're in science, uh, you know, maybe you're um, an undertaker. Um, <laughs> um, so you've got something that's inherited, you've got this stabilizing knowledge that's there to keep the world kind of ticking over, to make people feel safe. You, you, you've learned it, it's, it's, it's like, it's book smarts. Um, so the golden rule here is to really be a caretaker of your knowledge, but not a gatekeeper of it. Um, and then to use purposefulness and usefulness to build trust with the next generation of people who you want to see you as an authority. Um, so we were looking for examples that would make this really clear, and I swear we didn't choose this just to suck up to our host tonight, but I thought that the, uh, so the Google Arts and Culture Initiative is a really interesting example of this. You might recognize some of the faces on that screen. <laughs> Um, this is Google's uh, not-for-profit mission that's aiming to, um, to scan in super high-quality HD uh, all, the most, all the most important artworks around the world. So the dozens of museums like MoMA, like the Uffizi, like the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, uh, they get to really double down on their expertise as caretakers of timeless knowledge, people who know what good art is, because they learn it at university, they learn it from generations before them. Um, and then they hand over to Google how to make it purposeful, and then Google make it purposeful for the people. And they do it in a way, so it's like making it useful and not just imposing it. And they do it in a way that's quite playful and fun. And I think this is great. And I know there was some criticism of it um, in terms of, you know, you're kind of undermining the seriousness of art. But this is so, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, so they make that utility playful and they make it engaging. And who's maybe not getting this quite so right? So a really interesting recent example, <coughs> the Oscars. Did anyone see that the Oscars planned and then immediately unplanned the Popular Film Award this year? So they came out, they said, we're going to introduce a new award. It's super cool. It's the Popular Film Award. We're going to give you a Popular Film Oscar. And it just bombed. It like completely bombed. Everyone hated it. Um, and they had to backpedal, and then they, they canceled it. Um, so why is this an interesting case study here? Well, they broke all of the golden rules. Firstly, they misjudged the nature of their authority. They didn't understand where their knowledge was coming from. The Oscars is not really any longer an authority on knowledge about good film. Uh, it's, it's got knowledge about glitz and glamour and maybe a really good source of memes. Um, but if they want to be an authority for the next generation on excellence in film, then they really need to show what the source of that knowledge is. Why are they an authority on film? Because if they're just a load of anonymous white guys behind a panel kind of handing out gold statuettes, no one's really buying into that. Um, and secondly, so people weren't buying into the source of their authority, their knowledge. It didn't add up. And secondly, it's not useful. Uh, why does anyone need the Oscars to tell them what's popular? I, don't, I think we know what's popular, right? We don't really need the Oscars to tell, them, to tell us that. So it kind of fundamentally fails on, on both of the metrics which we are using to measure positive authority. OK, so what about if you're in this space, dis disruptive utility? So your, your knowledge, your authority comes from a knowledge base that's about your creativity. And you use your creativity to enable multiple better outcomes for the next generation. You're helping them live better. You're helping them feel better. You're helping them believe better things. Um, so yeah, maybe you're a tool, maybe you're an app, maybe, maybe you're a social movement. So what's happening here? The unspoken agreement for any brands in this space is we're only as powerful as you are when you're using our product. That's the tacit agreement. Authority is agreed in an ongoing fashion and it's agreed by consensus. So this is all about managing feedback loops of positivity and feedback loops of your users being happy that you're being useful. So I think a really interesting kind of case study here um, is, um, is not Kylie Jenner herself, but is what happened when Snapchat today, uh, changed their algorithm. I don't know if you guys remember this. They uh, dicked about with it a little bit and uh, then um, it changed how easy it was to see the messages you were getting from your friends and the messages you were getting from brands. And everyone went crazy. Uh, and then uh, Kylie said, she was like, Snapchat's over. She was like, I'm not happy with this. Snapchat's over. And 20% of the shared price was wiped overnight. Um, and, and we're thinking, yeah, sure, we get it. Like, you, need to, you need to do what people want. You need to keep them happy. Um, but I think it's really interesting understanding what happened in, in this context, because this isn't just about your tools not really working for people. This is about Snapchat fundamentally losing its authority. Uh, its authority in the space as a tool that gets Gen Z conversation more than anyone else. That's its whole point. Um, and that's why anyone's on it. And so it was undermining that. It was undermining its reason for existing. Um, and that's why it's always important to have good research. Um, <laughs> OK, so. And what about down here in Singular Visionaries? Oh, 
I, I, that was, she was supposed to be a surprise. I went for Rihanna <laughs> too soon. Okay, so what if your authority comes from your emotional or your moral wisdom? Your ability to use it to lead new ways of thinking and new ideals. I mean, if you're actually just an individual and not a brand, then this is kind of relatively straightforward. I think we're all familiar with this in culture right now. We see more and more people, you know, like we said, the Jeremy Corbyn paradigm, and we're thinking specifically, we're referencing his initial uh, popularity and maybe not his more recent complexities. Um, but someone like Rupi Kaur kicking off her career as a record-breakingly popular poet uh, by posting a picture on Instagram of her period bloodstained joggers. Uh, these are people who weaponize their humanity and honesty to become a new authority on ways of being a politician, on ways of being a woman, and on fundamentally on ways of being a person. So if you're a brand, can you do this? Like, maybe not, maybe you can't post a picture of your period stained joggers on Instagram, but, because that's not really gonna come across as particularly sincere. Um, but what we're seeing with brands in this space is they're doing really interesting things. They're increasingly, and I know I referenced our Y axis, which is all about your point as authority. Are you giving a functional use or are you giving an emotional use? What we're seeing brands doing in this space is increasingly kind of doing both, um, and, really, and really kind of seamlessly bringing them together. So as um, Anna pointed out when she took us through the mapping, we, we, we see these um, really useful but emotional brands like Bloom and Lola who are selling an idea but they're really fundamentally anchoring it to their product. Um, and the reason Rihanna is up here because, I mean, apart from the fact that Rihanna should just be in any presentation, um, is that even if you have a celebrity face, a human face to your brand that has as potent charismatic authority as Rihanna, um, you still need to emotionally root your, your kind of your wisdom and your utility in your product in this space. Because um, if you've seen her latest lingerie line, Savage Times Fenty, it doesn't have a particularly controlled aesthetic. Um, it's kind of all over the place. There's like feather boas and then there's lime colored lace and it's, it's great. Um, but it's got these, this kind of vast range of styles and um, this size range that incorporates everything and this emphasis on different skin tones. So you can always find a size or a style that really brings you to life. Um, and what that does is that really brings to life the singular vision of Rihanna in this brand of A, not giving a fuck, um, and B, always pushing an inclusive message. And so she's really got that holistic authority there. She's not just assuming she can push it with her personality. And I think that's really interesting when you compare it with maybe the last generation of brands who were operating in this space. So something like the Dove Real Beauty campaign. Um, so their incredible work here was actually a really classic and powerful example um, of how brands embrace being singular visionaries for millennials. Um, and it was using the singular visionary technique. It was saying, I'm about disruptive emotional intelligence in this space. I know what you need. You need me to tell you that there's something wrong. There's something wrong in the way we're talking about women's bodies. And, and we're going to be the first to kind of change that. And it was incredibly powerful. Um, and but in a way it was slightly disconnected, not from the product truth, but from the product itself. So it's an interesting question, like what would the Dove campaign for all beauty look like for Gen Z when they need it to be so much more connected to utility and in the product? So what about, where are we next? Oh, our last space, timeless connection. Okay, as Anna said, we debated this space a lot. Um, when we came up with our source list of what do we think is our real source list that we really want to analyze and pull apart, here, yeah, we only ended up with one, one source uh, that we, that we semiotically analyzed, which was Coco, um, the Pixar film. And it's not because this is a no-go area. We're not like, oh, you know, don't, don't go here at all, like, that's it. Um, but the strategic guidelines we've created, and which I said well, are detailed in our um, white paper, um, <laughs> in every other space, are really about replicating authority. They're about how can I, as a brand or as an, as an organization, how can I mimic or synthesize the way that authority already works in this space uh, with an integrity that works for me? Um, and actually, I think what's interesting is that arguably there's a lot of kind of millennial friendly black brands in this space. This is what I like to think of as the goop space, um, kind of drawing upon a stabilizing ancient wisdom of crystals, um, you know, and all, all of the other things that happen there. But do we know, like, can we be sure how Gen Z is, is connecting with that? Like, it's yet to be determined. So we're keeping a bit of a kind of wondering hat on here. Um, but I think what's interesting about this space is if you're a storyteller, if you're thinking about comms, like if you're looking, if you're a cultural creator like Pixar, you can tell stories that really bring this space to life. So the reason Coco is down there is because one of our research partners who was, um, who was researching the uh, context of new authority for Gen Z in Mexico, they were like, Coco's really, really resonated with young people 
in this country because it really brings to life the tension. It's about this young kid who goes off and wants to be a musical star and he has to grapple with the expectations of his kind of traditional family. Um, and they were saying it really brings to life a tension uh, that, of what this generation feels be about being caught between their aspirations. Their aspirations being so exploded, as we were saying, in, in the context that they're growing up in, so exploded and, and, and so kind of fraught and so kind of brilliantly liberating and also quite anxiety inducing on one side. And the need to really keep connecting to timeless connection authority, to your family, to the things that don't change. Um, so that's why that's there. So really, our advice for brands looking to draw on this space um, is really don't do it right now, but just understand it as deeply as possible. Um, because also I'd say that this space where the really unchanging, precious, and intimate connections that Gen Z live, is probably the one that's most likely to evolve soon. It's the one that is about, you know, really what we're talking about is children and young adults who are flying the nest. So it's the, it's the one that, that's most likely to evolve in the most interesting human and sensitive ways. Um, but the great thing is that that's what we're here to find out, because that's our job. Um, and we love doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susie, uh, Anna, and Michelle. Um, now, that is me on the right, and that's what I do. But more importantly, allow me to introduce our panel tonight, if they can make their way to the stage, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so we're hosting this panel of experts, because I'm sure you've got a lot of questions you want to ask. There's a bunch of questions I would like to ask as well. Um, they are living, breathing authorities in themselves. Um, now to start off, we've got Chloe right at the end, so I'll start off with you. Um, Chloe Combi is author of Generation Z, their voices, their lives, <laughs> which she actually named... <laughs> Which you actually named many years ago before the term got very popular. I do. A, yeah. a real, a real pioneer. Um, she has spoken on a range of issues, including but not limited to teenagers, education, young people in the workplace, sex, social media, pop culture in the 21st century, brand relationships, youth culture, beauty, and self esteem. She's about to go on a massive tour of 33 countries? Uh, 23 countries. 23 countries. Probably. Yeah. Um, and you're leaving tomorrow morning, so thanks so much for being here. <laughs> um, Chloe is currently working with Disney Studios on another original concept called The A to Z of Modern Girls. Um, to her left, we have stylist Charlotte Roberts. She's editor at large of Girl Power Zine Mush Pit. The zine is described as J17 meets Private Eye. If you're from Gen Z, you probably won't know what either of those things are. <laughs> um, J17 meets Private Eye. Mushpit is aimed at 20-somethings, strictly ad-free, sorry planners, um, <laughs> with a confident, satirical, silly, and fiercely political tone. Hello, Charlotte. And finally, uh, you saw him in the video earlier and a number of quotes from him. Ify Grillo is a poet, a campaigner, and politics student at Bristol University. Originally from Hackney, Ify has been both a youth MP for Shoreditch and vice chair of the British Youth Council. He was also a member of England's winning team at the Ooh. 2016 World Schools Debating Championships. So I'm not going to be arguing with him. <laughs> um, and finally, to my right here, we have Susie Hogarth, who leads Flamingo's in-house trends and foresight specialism, Flamingo Future. So a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> so I've got a bunch of questions and then we'll hand over to you. For yours um, but first of all I'd like to know from each of you um, starting with yourself Chloe who or what do you find authoritative and why in terms of for, for generation Z for yourself gosh um, who or what do I find authoritative I'm, I, I, I what I'd like to do is um, for, for myself is that I really um, I'm kind of worried about our willingness to listen to 
self-appointed experts and they're often the people who are the mouthiest and the stupidest um, and, and, and often the most ignorant and, and luckily I think we've slightly got we're, we're, we're in a kind of a U-turn moment and I think that 2018 might be or the end of 2018 maybe 2019 might be the moment that we start to turn our backs on them but certainly I think the you know the, the period we've seen with kind of Brexit and Trump and the sort of toxicity on uh, across social media and I think you know within, within within the kind of public and sort of political discourse certainly but the thing that I find authoritative are people who know their shit you know and, and we seem to have somehow have become fearful of people who actually are educated and knowledgeable and it doesn't have to be people who are kind of PhDs who will you know teach in the kind of hallows of Oxford University or Harvard University I think it's absolutely those people that have gained um, a breadth of knowledge whether it's through experience or learning and those are the people I find authoritative not the people who say I know something just because they shout the loudest or they say that they know it it's the people who have acquired that knowledge through actual proper learning or actual proper experience and those are the people that I really try to listen to. Um. Charlotte Roberts of Mushpit Zine and authority in itself, who do you find authoritative? Who or what? Often it's like people, like I, like you were saying, I think it's interesting, like this culture of like cancelling people very quickly, which I find kind of interesting. So you have this like kind of like icon of culture and immediately they do something wrong or like they do one wrong step and like everyone is up in arms and they're cancelled. Like <laughs> yeah. that's what happens on Twitter and Instagram in a second. Like we have these icons and then we tear them down. Mm -hmm. And kind of what we try and do with Mushpit is very much like we are sometimes hypocrites we do change our mind like the opinions that we had in issue seven are like drastically different now whether that's politically culturally whatever because obviously your opinions and the kind of things that you learn and knowledge is malleable in that way so I don't know that there can be like one stamp of authority it's like people you admire on Twitter who might be your peers who you're like they're so clever but then they say one thing and I don't know I don't it, it's a kind of it is a malleable thing in itself um, I guess I find anyone authoritative if I trust, I guess it comes back to trust that the store, their source, and not just the knowledge they have, but who they are as a person is something I can buy into. So, and that could be anyone, like that could be a parent, it could be a teacher. I just think the main difference is it's your, that title in of itself doesn't give, mean you have authority. It has to be more than just the title. So you being my you having X title, being a doctor, being a teacher, is not enough in of itself for me to find you authoritative. There has to be something extra alongside that. But as long as you have that extra, I don't think it matters whether you're from like a big company, whether you're like a young person, whether you're a five-year-old. If I see something in you, it clearly goes, I trust the words you're saying. And I think that trust can be acquired in a variety of ways and then I give you authority on a topic. Thank you, Fee. And finally, Susie. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I guess if I'm going to answer from a kind of personal level, so I'm like an older millennial, so I feel like my who I look to as an authority has changed, but as a kind of researcher, I kind of uh, look at it with like grim fascination. So I think I used to be pretty um, cliche in that, you know, I'd look to like The Guardian every day as my authority, but increasingly I'm finding myself looking to Twitter and being like, like I don't look to that single source anymore. I look to like what is the like what happens when I looked at all the different, I want to see every different opinion, but then you end up spiraling down into all these kind of uh, arguments. But I, fa I've, I feel like as someone who was a millennial um, and now as we as millennials are getting older, <laughs> I've kind of seen that shift happen and I can see the sources of authority kind of change. Thank you. Um, so my next question is for you, Chloe. Um, like ourselves, you are often advising brands um, about Gen Z and how to not appeal to millennial needs um, as opposed to Gen Z needs. Um, how do you manage your advice in not blurring those two needs? I think the thing that's going to really emerge a lot, maybe more than we think, is that as there is a vacuum of power or there's a vacuum of morality in politics and society, um, and there becomes this kind of absence of people who are in authority doing or, right, or saying the right thing. I think it's down to brands, or it's going to be down to brands increasingly, to take the temperature of young people and uh, stake the moral message. I mean, we've seen a really brilliant example this week with Nike and Colin Kaepernick. Whilst we have the man in the highest office of power in the world making these incredibly ignorant and racist statements, Nike took this, well, you know, it's very brave to be, when you're a multinational, it's brave to make kind of like statements. But they clearly, you know, marked their territory as to what their ideology was 
um, as to the Colin Kaepernick and the race thing. And they obviously were going to alienate a few perhaps older, white and more conservative uh, consumers, but they won themselves a hell of a lot more, and particularly younger audiences. And quite simply, I think it's going to be for brands in the future as we do become a binary and divided society to make a choice which side of the fence and the ideological fence they sit on. Because it seems as a society, we no longer can say, well, we can compromise, we can all get on and love each other. It's like you're one thing or the other and everyone's in opposition. And I think that's gonna become a requirement for brands to say, this is where we sit on this matter, this is what we stand for. And yes, we might risk alienating some people, but that means that we're gonna welcome perhaps the kind of people that we might want to. And unfortunately, I do think there is going to be a division in brands. And I think that's always been the case. I think sort of certainly for the last 70 years, there are brands that specifically do appeal to younger and older people. Um, and we saw that massively in the 60s and 70s. And I think maybe there was a relaxing of that in the 80s and 90s for reasons I won't go into now. But I think there's going to be a huge reemergence of that, of deciding, you know, feminist or anti-feminist. I'm not saying it's all black versus white, but, you know, particularly supportive of one cause or the other. And, you know, Nike played that brilliantly this week. And, of course, there were idiots burning their trainers, which they've already paid for. Good protest. But equally, they did very much put that kind of stake. And I think, you know, you saw their share prices. They skyrocketed, despite what Donald Trump said on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. And next for yourself, um, Ify Grillo. So a lot of what we've heard about um, in the presentation earlier was about the value of showing vulnerability and honesty and transparency. Um, we see that Gen Z are more comfortable with talking about issues of mental health. Why do you think that is happening today? What has shifted? Um, I think it's for two reasons. One, I'm not actually sure they've made the choice. I just think to some extent they have to. Like, I think the world has gotten, and this isn't to say, again, I'm not going to question whether the world's getting better or worse, but I think the conditions of the world has changed to the point that things are so bad when it comes to things like anxiety. How much you have a choice of whether you can talk about it when it's surrounding you is a lot less. Like, the, the increase in the number of young people who are diagnosed committing suicide means the average young person now knows someone who has serious imp serious illnesses who likely have committed suicide it's things which will have to come up in a way even if you don't want it to so i think you're kind of forced to become more comfortable with it because you're a lot more exposed to it from a younger age through both the people around you and social media when you grow up on social media it means you see it constantly so you become more comfortable talking about it but i think the second reason is that the people young people look to are also more comfortable talking about it people like influencers that's why one of the reasons youtubers do well is because they brand themselves as being like your big sister and your big brother but the way they do that is you can't do that by just showing the fun parts you have to also show the parts which are this is why i'm sad this is why i'm feeling a bit depressed and when you see the people you respect talking about it you feel you can emulate those conversations with your friends thank you iffy um charlotte roberts as editor of your zine mush pit um what do you think the, the, again, rise of DIY publication is doing for the way Gen Z perceive authority today? Well, I, so I do it with another guy, like, um, co-founder, um, and when we started it, it was, we were, like, students, so, and there weren't a lot of DIY publications at all, and it was born out of, like, an intense frustration with the kind of authority above us. In terms of, we were, like, interning and getting nowhere, we were working kind of semi, like, media fashion industries, and there seemed to be this real glass ceiling of, even though, like, we have, you know, huge privilege on our side, we lived in London, we could, you know, we could have lived at home if we needed to, all of that, but there definitely was this, like, cliquey glass ceiling, and none of the magazines were saying anything that we felt was relevant, like, you've got your Vogue, obviously now it's different, but at the time, it was just, like, not relevant. And then the kind of style magazines slightly were, but they kind of had lost that like humor and tone of voice. And a lot of what the early ones were about and still are is like extremely questionable life advice. Like we'd hear anecdotes from our friends that were like so ridiculous and hilarious. And we're like, we're just gonna write them down and put them in print, which is like stupid at the time. And we paid for it with our student loans and it kind of didn't have this like, it wasn't anything that we were, people often ask us like, did you do it to be like branded and have on your CV so you could do something after you finished. It wasn't, it was just very much about a kind of like, fuck you to all the, what had happened before. And obviously people have done that, like we're not the first to do it. And I think the rise of DIY publications, like kind of Gal Dem zine, ever since that has proved that you can have a niche and have a voice. I mean, our niche is not, you know, p particular to anyone. It was just like anxiety and depression and kind of like, 
boy problems, job problems, you know, it's nothing like drastic, but I think in the beginning brands were terrified of us because we were quite crude and we made stupid jokes. And now, and like often, like we had a girl with like armpit hair on on the cover and a brand who, I won't name, who um, had, was paying for some of the magazine or like helping us, um, was like, you can't use that image. And obviously now that's everywhere. So I think it's just, it's just about finding that voice and kind of sticking to it. And now it's an atmosphere where you can absolutely do that. And I think it's also a kind of like safe space away from all the social, like scrolling, 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 which is this like constant social anxiety. We kind of want the publication to be like, okay, you can turn the page if you want to, but you also don't have to. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have this like frenetic, franticness that social media gives us. Hmm. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, so audience, when Anna was showing that map earlier, you may have noticed something that we came across during our analysis on this study. And that is that a lot of the brands and people and institutions across all sections of the map were very much girl-led. They were girl-themed and female-led. So that's a question that came up for us um, during the process of this analysis. Um, so Susie, do you think that's true? And if so, why? Um, yeah, it was, it was something that came up to us. We were like, oh yeah, there's a lot of femininity here. There's a lot of feminine brands. And, um, but I feel like it would be, um, you know, we had to kind of be, when you're, when you're doing the kind of research part of what you do, you always try to be as like reflexive as possible and think about your biases and thinking about what you're missing. And I think obviously if we got too distracted by that, you're missing the obvious, like very kind of um, <coughs> overtly like masculine energy that's happening in like the alt-right and kind of authorities that are appearing over there. Um, but I, I, I think overall what we saw was a lot of what you call kind of feminine energy kind of, um, shaping your authority because when you take it back to the simple act of uh, looking at authority that's come out from um, digital natives, like the, the digital age is the social age, um, and it's undeniable that, fem stop doing that. Uh, that female voices have always kind of owned the social space. Like um, it, it makes me think of, I don't know if anyone's read, you probably have read Rebecca Solnit, but she talks about um, the ghost libraries. So throughout history we've had kind of standard libraries that are owned by men who always got to write, write shit down, uh, and women who always had oral histories. Like, that has fundamentally changed, and in the social age, those ghost libraries um, are now inhabited by very real people. So I think in that sense, yeah, it does feel feminine because uh, what has traditionally been an invisible space is now so, so visible. But um, the great thing that we didn't get the chance to really cover in this, uh, in this pres presentation is about what so much, so much authority that, that Jen said is questioning is the authority to say, you know, what gender is, what sex is, what sexuality is, and that's all being broken down as well. So um, yes, feminine in one sense, but very complex in others, I think. Thank you, Susie. Um, so we have some time for questions from you in the audience. Um, if you could put up your hand, if you have a question, wait for the mic to come to you. If you've got um, a question directed at one panel member in particular, then, then make that clear as well, please. Some mics coming around. Uh, a question behind yourself. Uh, Ify, I was wondering, you said that uh, for an institution, a person, um, a company to build uh, trust with you, um, they, you know, that was an important factor in terms of how, how they would, you would respect their authority. I was just wondering what are the kind of dimensions or factors um, that would go into that? How would, how would somebody build trust in, in your eyes? Um, I think as a for a brand, I think there's a number of ways you do it. I think firstly, it kind of comes back to what was said earlier, that being like apolitical and neutral in everything also means you don't seem relatable. And that's something which I think has changed with young people. Taking a stance isn't just because you need to take a stance, but also when you take a stance, that your brand now has a character. And every stance you take adds to the character of your brand. And I think but I also think you have to be careful of that. Because if you ask most young people with Nike, I think they will, all, they will f at first say they're happy with Nike's choice, but they will also say Nike did it as a business strategy because it made them loads of money. Like young people aren't gonna be duped. And I think that's the thing which like, they are very aware of that, but they'll be like, even if it's a business strategy, they're also pragmatists. They'll be like, it's a business strategy, but a business strategy we support. So we're happy to support that as a brand and their way of working. So I think when you take more stances, that's one way you build trust. Um, that also means there'll be people who do disagree with you with every stance, but as a person, as you become opinionated, you have people who agree with you and disagree with you. That's also how brands work. Um, I think other things you do to build trust 
is one who you like the groups um, as a brand in who's in the back office and who's uh, who's having those conversations. I think one of the biggest problems is that a lot of conversations with young people happen after the fact. So there's no point already like running a piece of pro a project, then going like, how do you going getting a research group of young people being like, now after we've spent 10 million, and let's be honest, we're not going to change the ad anyway. <laughs> we just want to tick box. What do you think of it? If they're not there right from the start, then there's a problem with your research. Like I'm always really skeptical of research institutions, brands, where I'm like, you only interview young people after the fact, because really they also will never take that seriously. Um, and that's why like, and I think the third thing is, you can't be all things to all people. And I think when you try and be all things to all people, you lose authenticity. I think a perfect example of this was the Pepsi ad. I think one of the reasons it seemed weird and young people didn't buy it is because it just tried way too hard. Like you could see every tick box they went through as you went through the ad. They're like, okay, we've got this. Okay, we've got every racial group. We've got this, we've got that, we've got that. But the more you try and do, you actually, that can ruin your authenticity. I think it's okay to sometimes just stick to one issue and make that your niche. Like you don't have to be like, as a brand look, okay, week one, we talk about racism. Week three, we talk about homophobia. <laughs> we'll get onto sexism and hopefully we can fit in transphobia at the end of the month. Like as a brand, sometimes while your ethos it's not about often what you explicitly just say, but your way of working needs to be diverse. That isn't saying you constantly talk about different types of messages, but you just are diverse as a brand. And I think when you do that and you look authentic, that's how you build trust. Can I have one thing to that very quickly? Um, the one thing I think that hasn't come out tonight for obvious reasons, because it's about authority, but actually, um, I think sometimes something that's missed with Generation Z, actually they're in some ways quite conservative generation. There's um, elements that are very conservative and there's a huge, um, um, increase in things like uh, sobriety, there's a massive decrease in recreational drug taking, um, there's a certain amount of social policing, um, and actually there's a real obsession with elements of childhood. So, for example, the massive like um, uh, fetishisation of childhood, things like stranger things and fun fairs and dessert things. And I think one of the things that Gen Z certainly want as well, because the world feels very chaotic, they want reassurance. They want basic reassurance and pleasure and something that actually people forget, something that makes them feel good and reassured and like this idea of sinking into great storytelling or a great brand that is pleasurable and nice and kind to them. I think that's a huge thing as well. So it is this really weird dichotomy of both being incredibly stimulating and quite challenging, but at the same time being quite reassuring and, and pleasant as well. And I think sometimes that's something that brands can miss. Sorry to interrupt your brilliant points. We've got a question at the front here. So mine actually was about the rise of conservatism in um, <laughs> Generation Z. So, um, yeah, but maybe it would be good to hear about what you think about the next generation, the one after Generation Z. Do you think they've started to emerge and yeah, what I, mindsets I mean, I, I think do they bring? The big thing is absolutely about economic stuff. That I think that the one thing that absolutely it holds massively in the balance for, and certainly is, is massively influencing Generation Z is the economy. Young people have been, and excuse my language, fucked by the economy. I mean, only 35% uh, of anyone under the age of 28 will ever own their home. That's not maybe, could be, ever. Um, and, and there is so much kind of held at the soft top in the baby boomer industry and so little in terms of savings and earnings, jobs sort of retracting. And obviously that what that doing is it, it's messing with the population. It's meaning that people move away from home much quicker and it's massively influencing every element of behavior and consumption and what they buy. For example, things like, um, purchasing cars is massively dropping off of the oldest of generations because they simply can't afford to drive. Whereas previous generations, as soon as you hit 17, you learned to drive, bought a crappy car and went on the road. Um, so I think that's the, so I think um, for Generation Z, I think um, a lot of their paths are undecided and a lot depends on kind of the economic health of, of kind of different countries. And that is influencing every aspect of their buying and their brand purchasing and what they're into and, you know, whether they're into luxury or, or economy. Um, and basically, I think that um, if... Um, the, so the, the emerging generations, let's call them Generation A, I think if the economy improves, I think that um, they will probably get the best of Generation Z, you know, the political activism, the liberalism, the openness, the, the sort of the technological revolutions, but will have hopefully kind of have an, sort of a, a, a softer landing, let's call it. But I think in terms of sort of Generation Z, I mean, the, the hard reality is if you go to university, this is Generation Z, you're going to leave with a debt somewhere between 30 and 50,000 pounds. That's going to influence every aspect of your life. So what I'm hoping is they take what has 
impact of really millennials and Generation Z. So a lot of people in this room, and you know, if there is a change in the political system, if there, if there is disruptions, that Generation A, let's call them, they'll have the best and hopefully not the worst. But at the moment, I think the, the big things that we have to really be concerned about is obviously economic health. If that, does that sort of help you a bit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think we've got time for one or two more. Um, there's a question over here. Yeah, how do you think you can recover um, if you make a mistake? I mean, because it's so easy to lose authority. Um, is there any example of anybody who has recovered that authority? And how do you think do you get to recover it? Do you want to? Um, I guess, like, I think it's hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, do, like, I do think it's incredibly hard. Um, I think there are things you can I don't think you ever can have a safe way of recovering, but I think there are things you can do which are going to make it less likely. Um, I think, firstly, not sweeping it under the issue. I think the way a lot of brands used to do is if they mess up, they're kind of like, cool, we'll like kind of down our social media for a bit, and then hopefully just in six months, no one will talk about it. Um, I think being extremely upfront with it, um, seeing, being clear what your like ways of change are, which isn't just saying, we're sorry for doing X, but this is why X happened. Here are the problems which led to X yeah. happening. And here's how we're going to change those problems. Like, I didn't generally think, like if you look at people like social media stars, like a lot of people mess up. When they mess up, what the first thing that happens is that they go on their notes app, they write an apology and post it on Twitter. And how good that first apology is defines whether they can ever come back or not. Um, and I think it's the same with brands. Like, uh, like with Do I remember Dove's ad with the soap, um, with the white woman and the black woman. And it was just like, their first one was kind of like, yeah, but you, didn't, that's, you only took the short form. If you look at the long form, actually, then it wasn't as bad as you're thinking. Like, examples like that, that's just never going to work. Mm. I think just being really honest about what leads to your mistakes mm. and, how, and whether those mistakes are a mistake or just your brand's culture? Because that's basically the question young people are asking. Is it a mistake because there was one person in your team and the answer can be fixed by just hiring a better team? Or is it just there is a culture in your brand which shuts people out, traps people in the middle and never leaves, lets them go up top? The people and the execs of your company. Because often when companies mess up, I'm always like, it's not that these companies are completely undiverse. So it's not true that all the people in the company are white old men. It's often just who are the people being listened to? Who are the people when they're warning you, are you actually listening to their warnings? Do they feel like they have the space and challenge to warn you because it's not enough to just have them in your organization if they feel like they can't really challenge you and say yeah like often you'll have a young person in the room and be like do you agree but realistically do they feel like they can actively call out their boss and be like i think you're misunderstanding a group and if you don't have all of those structures you'll just continually repeat mistakes it's it, like the Vice thing. I think Vice is a really yeah. good example yeah. of that. Like, you know, it's a radical news outlet. It's for young people. It was supposed to like all these verticals that they launched at very much the same time. And then all the Me Too stuff came out. And that was an example of yeah. the culture being like straight white men, yeah. like literally, it was like, it was the Me Too culture. It was horrible. And anytime any woman came out about it, the statements they made were so wishy-washy. They were so not admitting any of it was happening. There was a real like turning the other cheek to that kind of like work culture. Um, I think that's a good, a good example of what you're saying. I also think there's a massive difference between I'm sorry and I'm sorry you feel, feel bad about what yeah. I did because the former is genuinely atoning and saying I'm sorry for what you did and the other one is basically putting the onus on you which I think has been so you know and I think that's the thing that differentiated when people kind of go yeah well that seems genuine and that seems you know fake it's like the Louis CK thing of like I've been in my apartment for two months and now I'm back ladies <laughs> which shows absolutely no kind of remorse at all it's like well it takes, probably takes a bit longer for getting your dick out at work and masturbating in front of people. I don't know how long you have to at home for that. And that's obviously triggering a massive, massive conversation within the culture. And it feels like maybe you need a bit longer. Maybe you should go and work with some women or, you know, just do a female comedian tour or like don't get your dick out at work tour or something like that. But, but the, the point being that there is that absolutely that thing of like, I'm sorry versus I'm sorry that you're overreacting to me. And that, that is a big, big contrast. I'm sorry to my mum who's sitting there and heard with now joking, she's not here. Um, we've got time for one more question over here. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, um, there's a lot of conversation around Gen Z and there are a lot of big trends that are happening and we've seen, you know, Gucci, Vetman, Off-White, Burberry changing their logo. So this is big big you know rise of authenticity and i'm just wondering we want to keep it authentic all of us want to get value from this how do we not 
get into a point where there's a commoditization of authenticity, how do you keep it fresh? And what's next, obviously? Um, I, I guess I would say that if you, if you feel like you're commoditizing auth authenticity, then it, it sounds like you're already kind of doing authenticity wrong. That's probably a good kind of sign. And I think it comes back to the, um, the initial uh, golden rule that we had, which was just like, no, I think it's just like being a, a person. If you, if you want to be a really sincere person, the first thing is to really know yourself. And I think, I think that's as important for brands as well, just really, really understanding, like we were saying with authority, it's like, where does that come from? Like really, really kind of soul searching. And so I think it's self-awareness and it's self-knowledge should automatically protect, protect against kind of moving into to commoditization or, or what, I, what I, I feel like you're implying is the kind of synthesizing authenticity and like chopping it up into little, little, little chunks. I think if you really, if you really use, I think it comes back to that, um, the kind of feminization of culture idea that using emotional intelligence, so self-awareness, looking at, like understanding yourself to understand what it is, what the source of your authority and your authenticity is. Yeah, and I guess what I'd add to that is authenticity, authenticity can mean different things to different people. And you don't have to, I don't think, I think what, where brands most go wrong is where they look at one brand's way of being authentic and then go, that's how you be authentic, so we'll copy that. And it links back to what you were saying about you need to know where your knowledge is. Um, and that, individuals do it as well. Probably a good, a good example is like Beyonce. I mean, we've talked about Rihanna, so we might as well talk about Beyonce. <laughs> um, like Beyonce's state brand has always been Queen B, but what that has meant over the last 10 years has changed drastically. If you look at her last couple, like Lemonade, her last couple of albums, that's all about being completely, up, absolutely vulnerable. Like she still brands herself as a queen and that sort of that, but it's queen through myself. Like if you look at it, it's about, she talks about her affair being cheated on, what it means to be a woman, a black woman. That's still her, her authentic voice but her brand is still queen but someone else can't be like yeah i'm going to do what she did and that's the point you can be authentic but it still has to be your it only works if it is actually your version of authenticity and you telling your own truth you can't replicate other brands in the way you do with other market strategies yeah thank you very much um thanks to our panel thank you to susie of flamingo futures if you grillo poet and campaigner stylist and editor of Mushpit Zine, Charlotte Roberts, and author and authority in herself, Chloe Combi. Thank you for all of your questions. So unfortunately that concludes this evening. Um, as Susie said, we're going to be sending out a detailed white paper with more detail on the findings in the next couple of weeks. It will go to everybody who's come this evening. Um, in the meantime, there's a kind of short summary fold out of everything we've discussed in your bags that you're going to take away with you. Do get in touch with us if you've got any questions you'd like to ask. We'd be very happy to come in to talk to you, to think about doing kind of tailored versions of this to you and your organisations if you want to either speak to us afterwards or get in touch via the email address that's, that's on the fold out in your pack. So all that that leaves for me to do is to say a lot of thank yous. It's like my own mini Oscar speech. So first of all, thank you to all of you for coming, um, for all your questions that you've um, given to the panel and for being here this evening. Thanks, as Tarek said, to our wonderful panel um, for answering your questions so brilliantly. Thanks to the APG, thanks to Google for hosting us. We love doing stuff like this. Our team get to show off. Um, and I think a special one for me, thank you to the, all of the guys you've heard from tonight at Flamingo for the team behind the scenes who've helped put this together. We really hope that you've enjoyed it and found it as interesting as we have to work on. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Take care.